and welcome to another very special episode of the AutoCAD Professional Dialogue. This particular episode is also special because our guest today is someone who is not only a renowned designer in the global automotive industry, but also is a serial entrepreneur whose latest mission is to build the world's most sustainable vehicles, as he says. I'm talking about none other than Mr. Henrik Fisker, Chairman and CEO Fisker Inc. Mr. Henrik Fisker, thank you for joining us on this show and uh, good to have you uh, joining for this uh, interview from all the way from California. It's great to be with you, Sumantra, again. Good to see you. And uh, well, uh, Mr. Fisker, let's start off with uh, taking a look at the whole electrification trend. Uh, for the EV industry, are the prospects any different now than what it was, one, what they were, let's say, in January when he first unveiled uh, the Fisker Ocean SUV? Well, actually, I think it's, it's been very interesting to see what's happening do it, during COVID-19. Uh, we actually have got even more orders during the COVID-19. So we have this flexible app, the Fisker app, and we also, of course, on our website, take reservations. And we have seen an uptake and a lot of people engaging with us. And uh, I think for me, one of the most amazing things to see, uh, even during this very tough crisis was, as we didn't have all the cars on the road, we suddenly could see the blue skies. We suddenly saw pollution moving away. And we actually, I think, realized how fast nature was able to heal. And I think it even went beyond uh, scientists' expectations of what they thought was going to be possible. I know a lot of scientists said, you know, it's going to take, you know, hundreds of years for us to repair what we have damaged. But I think nature showed how fast it's moving. And for me, that was an amazing sign. I think for a lot of people around the world, it was sort of a sign of hope that actually, if we would imagine, make all our daily transportation electric, that means we could have a severe impact on our health and our environment. And for me, uh, I'm not the only one that, that thought that, obviously, because we saw a big uptake. And I actually think when it comes to electrification in the industry, not only has it moved the buyers, the consumers, uh, people to think about electric cars, but I also truly hope it has moved our politicians to help create the infrastructure needed to help push for electrification. Because the faster we can push for that, the more we can actually start again enjoying our vehicles the way we want to enjoy them without having to damage the environment. I think any crisis, any disaster, always you should take the learnings and see what happened during that. And obviously this was a disaster crisis. Uh, it's hurt the world economy. Uh, it's been terrible. People have died. People got sick. Uh, people lost their jobs. It, it has been absolutely terrible. However, we also need to see what we can learn from that. And let's not forget that one of the reasons you get sick in the first place is because sometimes you have a weak immune system. And why do you get a weak immune system? You get that because you breathe unhealthy air or because you are sick or you have preconditions. And one thing that's very clear that pollution leads to lung disease, which leads to humans being more susceptible to getting sick, specifically for something like the COVID-19. So I think the lessons learned here is that we should accelerate uh, the adoption of electric vehicles. We should accelerate the effort to create a cleaner environment because ultimately that means we are going to be healthier. Our children are going to be healthier and we are going to live a healthier life. And hopefully we won't be so hard hit if there's ever a pandemic like this again. Right. And as we speak uh, uh, on this World Environment Day, both uh, your country, USA, and my country, India, are really fighting tough battles in the uh, against COVID-19 and our thoughts and prayers with those who are fighting, battling it. And uh, hope this uh, episode ends uh, at the earliest. Uh, coming to the, ele uh, the prospects for electrification, there is also the argument that the whole well-to-wheel argument is still not in favor of electric vehicles. So how, how long do you think it will take uh, for that also to kind of be favorable for the EV industry? Because 
I mean, today, if it's not in, in favor of the EV uh, for the electric vehicle, you are you're still polluting somewhere else, right? Well, I think this is a very bad argument. Look, I think it, reality is there is a huge lobbyist group and there's a, a very big business uh, around uh, you know, oil and everything else that of course needs to make sure that they still can make money. Now I spoke with uh, somebody from one of the biggest oil companies in the world and he was saying, you know, we are looking of ways to use our oil for other things than necessarily power gasoline cars. And let's not forget, there's many things we need oil for, whether it's making plastic, uh, which is made in a lot of, used in a lot of products or whatever it might be. And we can also do a lot of this manufacturing in much cleaner ways. But I think ultimately, when we look at electrification, we're at the very early stages of this new technology. And of course, there's a lot of things that we have to solve. I, for instance, just uh, sat on the board of a cobalt mining company in North America, which were all about ethical mining of cobalt instead of doing it in Congo. Uh, so there's a lot of efforts that are being done, recycling the batteries later in life. Uh, but in the end of the day, we've got to get this thing going. I don't think there's any excuse anymore. Uh, we can keep on talking about, you know, all kind of micro things that might or might not happen. But reality is we got to look at the big picture. And the big picture is we've got to clean up the world. There's no doubt about it. And I know India has taken some massive steps. You see what's happening in Mumbai, where, yes, it's much easier for us to use a plastic straw to drink, you know, a, a Coke or something. But, you know, it also pollutes incredibly much. And, and so we need to make some decisions about our life. Do we want our children to live a healthy and amazing life? Or do we want them to die early and suffer and live up in an unhealthy world? No, we don't. So that means we have to change. And in my view, I believe it's not the right way to ban the things we like. We need to come up with solutions. We need to come up with new technical solutions. We need to come up with desirable solutions. One of the issues with electric cars is they have not been desirable. They are too low range. They were small and ugly. Uh, they were too expensive. There were so many hindrances for people to adopt electric cars. And you can't, you can't force people to adopt something they don't like or that's too expensive they can't afford. So we need to move towards a new generation of electric vehicles. And I think, I mean, that's what we are trying to do. We are trying to bring really exciting, you know, beautiful electric vehicles that are affordable to the market. And I think that's the only way forward. We will solve all the technical problems, whether it's recyclable, how we make batteries, that will all be solved over the next year. It's not gonna happen overnight. It takes time. Right. And uh, that brings me to your uh, uh, first vehicle, uh, uh, the Fisker Ocean, uh, which I think uh, on the day of the unveil is the last time we spoke uh, at uh, when you were at Las Vegas. Uh, uh, how, how, how has been the response? You've, you've said that you've got a lot of bookings. Can you just quantify how much of bookings? And last time when we spoke, you also mentioned that you've got a fair level of interest from uh, Indian customers too. So. Uh, has the interest level from is uh, reached a level for which you may have may we may look at uh, introducing the uh, ocean in India uh, in the same year as you would in the U.S. maybe in 2022? Well, first of all, we have had a tremendous uh, response to the Fisker Ocean. You can see it here behind me. Um, it's it's a affordable, very very cool looking SUV, compact, sort of the size of a BMW X3. Uh, that type of size Porsche Macan. And uh, we will offer up to uh, 300 mile range, about 500 kilometers range. And we'll offer some different range configurations. One of the, my goals with this vehicle was, was to, first of all, create some very unique features that nobody's ever done before. So we created something called the California mode where all the windows roll down, including the rear window and the rear three quarter windows by the push of one button. But also we wanted to create uh, some very unique, unique sustainability features. So we went out and tried to find out how we could come up with uh, really recycled materials, specifically in the interior. So we worked with some suppliers and we came up with all the carpets in this vehicle is made from recycled plastic bottles and fishing nets from the ocean uh, and several other uh, recycled materials. So we have had a, an amazing feedback globally. I believe we have uh, orders, reservations from about 32 countries, including India. 
Uh, we have about 25,000 people who signed up to our digital app, the Fisker app, where you get all the information. You can review the, the, the vehicle. It's, it's very cool. And in the future, we will actually interact directly with our customers and potential customers through this app. Now, with India, as you know, what's very unique about the Indian market, in my, my view, and by the way, my wife is from New Delhi. Um, so I travel quite a lot to India. I love Diwali. I love the parties. I love the way the Indians can party for seven days straight. It's great. Uh, but apart from that, uh, you know, one of the unique things about the Indian market is that it has a very large, um, very low cost market for vehicles. And it has a growing market for the mid segment. And of course, you've got the luxury market. But if you look at the mid segment, Compared to how big India is in co comparison to anywhere else in the world, the mid-segment market is still fairly small and it's fragmented between a lot of different car companies. So it's very difficult for one car company to get enough volume in India to actually create a manufacturing plant in India. But that said, uh, I think what's interesting is that uh, very few companies have really taken India serious when it comes to electrification. There's a few electric cars that come to market, but I think India could really be one of those countries what, which could adopt electrification really quickly. Uh, obviously, there's a couple of things that's needed. Uh, first of all, we need um, an electric infrastructure that's stable. Uh, we also need the government to support this idea with both incentives and helping create this infrastructure. Right. Right. And those are things that we are not in charge of as a private company mm -hmm. that has to be done uh, from the government in India. And then we need the, the business leaders in India to truly be interested in this, invest in this. And we see in America, for instance, uh, you know, it's uh, large uh, funds are investing in that all over America. You know, they invest in electric vehicle companies. We have our self-investment for a large company like Caterpillar. You know, they make industrial machinery, but they ultimately want to go electric. So one of the things that's missing from India is the interest from the wealthy industrial owners and companies in India. Uh, they haven't quite turned around yet and pushed for this. And honestly, it needs to come from the private sector. There's a lot of wealthy companies in India. And I think it's, it's their duty to move this forward because with that, they could actually create an economic revolution in India because with electrification comes high technology, comes manufacturing, manufacturing of batteries, man manufacturing of vehicles. And personally, I would love to manufacture our vehicle in India. Uh, I think we could make uh, a version in India that would be much more affordable than what we're doing here in the US. Right. Uh, and I think if we can also create battery manufacturing in India, that would further reduce the cost, but we need some local business support, and I haven't seen that yet. And uh, you also you mentioned twenty five thousand people have kind of uh, got onto your uh, digital app. Uh, is the overall booking number somewhere in that region also? And you yeah, you know, it's how much uh, from India. Well, we, we well, I I don't want to say how many is from India yet, but we have quite a few from India. But one of the things that we have to be very honest with people in India when they order and they ask us, when are we getting the car? We have to say, honestly, we don't know because it does have to do with the market. You know, we can't bring, you know, 2000 cars to India. It's too small a market for us. It's too much for us to have to set up because don't forget, we have to set up sales service. We have to support the people. So we need to get into some real numbers. And I think they have to be beyond 10,000 vehicles to truly make the effort worth it to make that investment. And what I would like to see is if we do have a high interest from India, the best thing in India would be to produce the car there because as you know, India has very high import taxes. So the vehicle becomes very expensive uh, if you import it into India. So the ideal would be that we would see a market potential, but I don't even need to get 10,000 orders. I just need to see a commitment from the government and from the local businesses, the big right. investment funds in India, right. they need to show commitment because we need to understand that there's a long-term commitment to grow this market. Right. And I think India would be ideal. And if you compare India, for instance, to China, 
it's very interesting because China is so oversaturated with startup companies, with car companies. I mean, I think there's more than a 500 car companies in China. If you connect, if you actually, if you actually count all the startup companies, there's over 500 car companies in China, and the population is pretty close to India. In India, I think there's like two car companies, Tata and Mahindra, and that's it. And then you got some local production of Suzuki and a few Chinese companies and and Korean, but the really is very small. So the possibility in India is actually quite big, but right. nobody has made the step to say, let's do it. And you are ready to do it, provided the uh, environment is conducive. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. And uh, also, uh, Henrik, uh, you, are, you have pitched the Fisker Ocean as the world's most sustainable uh, product. And uh, you have a vision yourself for a clean future uh, as an entrepreneur. And uh, tell us, uh, in terms of the uh, sustainability quotient, in terms of the, the recycled materials which you have used for components, uh, uh, the carpet, May made from recycled fishing nets, for example. How do, how will you sustain that uh, pitch? And uh, as some some critics may say, how will you kind of make it more than just uh, a, maybe a marketing gimmick? Well, it's not a marketing gimmick. You know, we have uh, partnered up with a giant supplier here in the U.S. who actually is making these carpets and actually, uh, uh, you know, locating all this debris from the oceans, the world oceans. So we act, this is actually real. So we are truly doing that. Uh, we are truly using uh, you know, vegan leather all over our vehicle. And we are, by the way, the first to do that in our original Fisker Karma. We I, also, I, that reminds me, the moment you said that, uh, the vegan interiors, it reminded me of the Karma. <laughs> exactly. And we also uh, were the first to do a full curved uh, solar roof on the entire roof of the vehicle with the Fisker Karma. We are doing that with this vehicle as well. The, uh, the, the solar has been improved dramatically. We still cannot, I think, make enough power to uh, power the vehicle alone with solar, but we want to get going. We want to use the technology. So once it gets improved, we will obviously enhance it. Now, all this is the beginning. And we will quantify, by the way, all, everything we're doing. And it's not just about using recycled materials or being electric or using solar roof. It's also about how do you manufacture the vehicle? So do you make a lower carbon footprint, for instance, by using an existing manufacturing plant versus building a new one? Uh, are you creating a flexible lease, which we are, where you can lease our car in Europe and US uh, and you can give it back anytime. You can give it back like after three days, after three months, after three years. And even if you lease our vehicle as a used vehicle, we get full warranty on the vehicle. We change the tire, we take care of all the service. So we are trying to create as much sustainability as we can. We are trying to reinvent the automotive industry. And we also want younger people to be able to afford to get into our vehicles. Because today, a lot of young people, they can afford to you know, finance a $40,000 car. Or, or how much is that in lakh in, 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 in India? I don't know. But... About 25 lakh, 30 25, lakh. 26 years. Yeah. yeah. About. Well, you know, a lot of young people can't afford to, to finance that. They don't want to finance and, and, and owe all this money on a car. But if they could go out and, find, and, and just, you know, lease this car and knowing that if they get unemployed or if something happened, they can just give it back. So we have created a very unique lease like that. So I think we're trying to change the way we, we are dealing with customers and also the fact we are going directly to the customers. So we are no middlemen. So yeah. in a normal car industry, you're a lot of middlemen that has to make a profit, which is why cars become more and more expensive. In our case, we go directly to you, the customer, right. and that's why we can offer a cheaper lease and rate. And that's how you kind of enhance the affordability, which I, which I recall, uh, I think uh, on, the, the, on the eve of the ocean, uh, Ocean's uh, deb, uh, unveil at CES, you had a, it at the select meet, you mentioned that for electrification to catch up, become mass scale, Affordability will be key. And that is also linked to you know, your sustainability pitch. Uh, yeah. now, now that the, the journey has started, uh, I mean, uh, in terms of product, how, wh what is the run rate you expect to would like to have for your company in terms so of we, product introduction, let's say, yeah, so and I the think, affordability pitch? I think it's probably a little too early to, uh, you know, I, I don't want to sit here and, and, and 
randomly talk about how many vehicles we're going to produce, but you know, it's a high volume car. So we are not, we are talking more than 50,000 a year for sure, even initially. Uh, and it has to be when you make a high volume car because that's the way you get the prices down. But one of the things we have done, which is very, very unique in the industry, you know, it's a very ego driven industry, but nobody wants to work together. Everyone want to brag about they made their own car. There's a lot of startups that have gone out there. They have failed because they try to make their own car and it's extremely difficult, very capital intensive. And anybody who's not in the car industry and even people who's in the car industry, they underestimate how difficult it is to make a car. So what we have done is we have partnered up with some other very large companies, uh, OEM here uh, in, in the world to basically cut down the cost, cut down development time, share supply chain. I mean, one of the things that's gonna happen with electric cars is that a lot of, I believe in the future, car companies will share components like battery cells, electric motors, inverters, because there's no difference in the vehicles between these right. things. Right. You need to get the volume up and the price down. And that's the first way to make that happen. And as we notice also the collaboration, uh, in, earlier, in earlier days, it was an exception. Then it was becoming a kind of a norm over the last four or five years as the global mega trends of electrification and the connected vehicles and autonomous and shared mobility is catching up. But now, I think now it's getting fast forward and it's becoming almost a necessity, the, the strategy of collaboration. So when you mentioned uh, collaborating with uh, some big OEMs, uh, does it include the big three from uh, USA? I can't say who it includes yet. We're going to make an announcement here in the next couple of months. Um, and I think it'll be very exciting. People will be very amazed. Uh, but what it does for us is it gives us the ability to offer vehicles at a very, very competitive price with a very premium high-end design. And right. I think that's, that's our key differentiator. And uh, talking about collaboration, I mean, and you also talked about the prospects in India. How about maybe, you know, for the same reasons, having a collaboration with an uh, Indian company like, say, Mahindra or Tata Motors, which both of them, have strong interest in electric vehicles. Do you see a possibility there as well? Or would you be open? Well, you know, I, know, I know both of the great founders. I know Anand Mahindra. I know uh, Ratan Tata, very, very good friends. Uh, I email them once in a while. Um, saw Ratan actually here in, in California not long time ago. Uh, they are amazing people. Uh, they have done an amazing job in a very diff difficult uh, you know, economy and, and being in India and having to manufacture cars for such low cost is, is unbelievable. Uh, you know, anything is possible in the future. Uh, it, like I said, it's a complicated industry and to create partnerships is very difficult in this industry. It takes a lot of effort, a lot of investment. And, and I think in the future, uh, we will see some large conglomerates maybe outside the car industry taking part of these investments. We're already seeing when it comes to autonomous driving or batteries or software, we are seeing non-automotive companies uh, taking the lead in investments in a lot, lead in, in investments in a lot of these areas. So I think the automotive industry will see the biggest change it's ever seen in the next five years. And I think you're gonna see some of the bigger car companies becoming a lot smaller or even disappear. And you're gonna see some new car companies and even some non-car companies emerging right. as, as leaders. Significant players. Right. Uh, we are running out of time, Henrik, but before I can't uh, leave you without uh, talking about automotive design and, uh, and uh, tell us uh, this, these trends of electrification and more so uh, autonomous uh, driving. How will these two mega trends uh, kind of influence uh, automotive design in the, in the uh, coming years? I already see uh, in the uh, ocean behind you, at least in the front part, there's some kind of you know, unconventional design elements. <laughs> yeah, you know, I mean, I've incorporated a radar, which is the higher level of a radar. We have two radars in the vehicle, of course, because of autonomous features. I think uh, we are very far away from having full autonomous vehicles with no drivers or no steering wheels. This is probably 10, 20 years from now, at least when it comes to privately owned vehicles. Um, I think electrification will uh, do a lot of, for design. It will change the percept, it will change what we can do as designers because we're not so prohibited by 
gasoline engine out in front and, and the gas tank in the rear, the batteries on the floor. And it'll also change a bit the proportions of vehicles. In the beginning, some of the vehicles will be a little higher because we sit on top of a vehicle, but then it will start changing as we get lower batteries, thinner batteries. But I think overall, what's going to happen is, let's face it, there's been a lot of predictions about we're all going to be moved around these sort of little ugly white pods, some little squares, a little eggs, and we're all going to get moved around those. I think in the end of the day, as, you know, humanity, as, as, as humans in our civilization, once we have the basic need sort of done, meaning like once we have either the rice and meat, you know, then we want to have a little bit more beautiful food. We have to have it nicely prepared. We want to have some spices in it. We want to enjoy it. And I think cars are very important in our society. It's a pride to own a car. It's, it's, you know, we like to walk down the street and see a beautiful car. And in my view as a designer, the more beauty we can create in our society, the more happy people are, whether it's a right. movie, whether it's a chef that prepares a perfect meal, whether it's a painter, whether it's a beautiful building, whether it's a beautiful car, if we can create beauty, that is something good for humanity that actually makes people happy. So I think design, when it comes to electric cars, are gonna be even more important because it's not anymore about the sound of the gasoline engine or how the gear shifts. It's gonna be about how the car looks, how the user interface happens, and that's all about design. So design, is actually going to expand beyond belief in the future. Therefore, the role and value of design in an electric car would be, you are saying, more than in a conventional IC engine car. It'll be way more because when you're in an electric car, this is what's going to be important for you. It's, the user interface, by the way, is also designed. The graphics mm. on a big screen, how do you interact with that? The graphics on your app when you buy the car, so design will be very, very important in the future. And I also think that it'll be the, one of the only ways that brands can differentiate themselves because it's not anymore about, like I said, how the gasoline mm. sounds, yep. how much torque it has. Every electric car has torque. Every electric car is pretty fast. Yes. And every electric car is silent. So now you have to find a differentiator somewhere else in your brand DNA, and that's going to be design. Right. Uh, very briefly, uh, Henrik, uh, the learnings from... This car automotive uh, that you have kind of uh, implemented here. So the learnings from Fisk Automotive is it's incredible capital intensive to make a car. Uh, it's very difficult to be the first. We were the first. We came out with the Fisk Karma one and a half year before the Tesla Model S. Uh, we took a lot of risk. We had to because there was very little uh, suppliers available or technology. Uh, our battery company was a startup. It was the first one out there. And unfortunately, in the middle of our launch, they went bankrupt. So this time, we don't want to take these technology risks. That's the lessons learned. We also don't want to do everything ourselves. We want to collaborate. So that's the lessons learned. Uh, so I think these two things are the main lessons learned. The third part, where we're just simply different, or if see, there's two more parts. The third part is that we are starting with a high volume vehicle, uh, affordable. Uh, but still amazing design, the Fisker Ocean. And then the fourth part is we're really rethinking how the customer is going to interact with us. And I think what happened during COVID-19, people are becoming extremely confident with everything digital, to buy everything online, buy everything via an app. And our vehicle, you can buy it online, buy it on an app. Everything is going to be digital. You're going to get your insurance over the app, your insurance code, configure your car, we'll be able to ride hailing, car swapping, everything over the app. Right. And I think in the future, a lot of people will buy a vehicle, you know, either online or over an app without even test driving it. So right. we have adapted to that. And I think it's a very important part of our strategy at Fisker. Right. And uh, talking about uh, price, uh, now that uh, the COVID-19 has really kind of uh, affected the economy, like perhaps uh, uh, never in the recent past, uh, would you be able to, uh, launch it at the price at which you announced when you eventually do the market launch in 2022. And also, the, from a pricing perspective, the ocean comes quite close to the uh, in the region of the Tesla Model 3. So, how do you see a comp uh, Fisker uh, Inc. Uh, competing with Tesla? Well, look, uh, 
you know, we have a lot of competitors out there. I think we are the best priced and you will see we'll have a lot of uh, standard uh, options in our or standard equipment in our car. Uh, we are different vehicle. We are more of a pure SUV. We have a lot of space in our vehicle. It's very versatile. Uh, but we will keep the price of our vehicle. Uh, the COVID-19 has no effect on that. Uh, we have some very big partners that enable us to stay with this pricing, staying on time. We're still going to launch our vehicle in second half of 2022. Uh, so we are on track, and but what I do think is going to change after COVID-19, at least in the near term, is people's going to look for value. Uh, they want value for money, and they're also going to look for not having to commit. And that's where our flexible lease come in. You know, in our vehicle, you don't have to commit to three years to get our car, and then you're stuck with it. So I think that's going to be a very big part. Uh, and then I think also we're going to go beyond electric. I think it's about, are you truly sustainable? Are you truly you know, environmental, social, and governance. You know, how do you run the company? Uh, how do you treat your employees? And how do you generally, you know, uh, operate in your company when it comes to sustainability and the environment? And we are, uh, we are actually attacking all these areas. And I think it's going to be very important. And I think we're going to take a lead in that area. That's good to know uh, that you're look, taking a very macro uh, perspective in this whole sustainability pitch. I think... Uh, that's very uh, that's good to learn and uh, and uh, you didn't mention about your take on tesla well sumantra i don't like to speak too much about competitors i think look everybody is, is, you know, we're going to have a lot of competitors out there and we need to every every company every brand needs to find areas where they're unique right. we want to lead in design we want to lead in the customer experience the digital customer experience we want to spend a lot of time on developing software for battery management to get longer range. And we want to lead, we want to lead 100% in sustainability. We, our mission is to create the world's most sustainable vehicles. And our vision is a clean future for all. And we want to lead in that. That's a fantastic note to end this interview with, but I can't let you go without uh, asking your personal favorite. Uh, if you had to pick between the, Z8 and the DB9, <laughs> which one would it be? You were, you were involved in both. You know, I think I would probably pick the BMW Z8 only because it was my first project where I was left alone to design a car. So it has something very deep down my heart. Uh, it's great to see that the price of the vehicle keeps going up and not down. It's probably one of those few cars you can buy where you aren't losing money on it. Uh, it was an, a tremendous experience uh, to, to design that car uh, and see it come to market exactly the way I designed it. It's great to see that it became, you know, a timeless design, got in the Bond movie. Uh, so it's, it, it was just a fantastic experience. And I love whenever I see it in the street and I see people smile when they see it, that's probably the best thing that, that ever happened to me, just getting that smile on my face and enjoying somebody paid so much money for this car and enjoying it. Absolutely. I can think of, no, I mean, I, I can't think of anything else that kind of give a, uh, an automotive designer or let's say an architect of a arch structure to give that kind of, a, not uh, to give that delight, that level of delight when you see such uh, consumer reactions. It was an awesome project. Samantha. Great. Very, very cool. Great. Uh, Hendrik Fisker, uh, Chairman and CEO of Fisker Inc. Uh, as the world's most sustainable uh, car producing company and uh, wishing you all the best uh, Hendrik and uh, thanks for joining us once again. Sumanja, thank you and thank you to Autocar and uh, I'm happy to talk to everybody in India about cars. I love the country. I love the food. I eat way too much Indian food but I love it. It's great to be with you again. Looking forward to bring our cars to India eventually. Yeah, thank you very much and we look, uh, we hope it happens sooner than later and uh, Thanks everyone who is for watching this special episode of the Autocar Professional Dialogue. We meet again. Stay safe, take care, and stay healthy. Goodbye.